but we started a series today about a healthy heart. And tonight we're talking about the physical heart. Next week we're going to talk about our spiritual heart and how they tie in together. You know, when you're talking about the heart and how important the heart is. I found this research and I was going to read this uh, paper for you. It said the human heart is truly amazing. It's about five inches long and weighs nine to 11 ounces. And it's about the size of your fist. This amazing little muscle pumps something like 17,200 quarts of blood a day through the human body, and it does it for years. That equivalents 6,278,000 quarts a year being pumped over a 70-year lifespan, something like 439 million quarts of blood being pumped in your veins. Every cell in your body needs oxygen to live. As we know, to function, the role of the heart is to deliver the oxygen-rich blood to every cell in the body to make sure it gets there. But the disease related to the heart kills over a million people in the United States every year, and it's climbing. Heart disease is Americans' leading health problem and causes death. At least 55 to 56 million people in this country suffer from some form of heart disease. So you can be... So as you begin to look at the numbers, it's staggering. Every 34 seconds, a person in the United States dies from a related heart disease. So as I've been talking here, several people have died from this. More than 2,500 people die every day. About 6 million are hospitalized every year with cardiovascular disease. And it's not talking about those who just go to the hospital, necessarily survive with uh, proper treatment. Since 1900, cardiovascular disease has been the number one killer in this country, except for one year in 1918, the leading cause of death. Now we know that the things that we are concerned about, about our heart, a good, healthy heart, takes diet, takes exercise, and takes focus. Without diet, exercise, and focus, we will not survive. Wow. When you're talking about the heart, the most powerful object within our body to sustain life is our heart. A million people die every year from cardiovascular disease, heart attacks. I was just going to ask a question here. I'm going to ask, uh, if you're embarrassed to say that, you don't have to say it, you don't have to raise your hand. How many of you guys have high blood pressure? Raise your hand if you have high blood pressure. How many of you guys have had, anybody have a heart attack? Anybody in here has had a heart attack? In the first service, we've had a heart attack. We have one here. Now, I don't know if you guys remember this. On Easter Sunday about five years ago, anybody here Easter Sunday five years ago? I had a guy actually pass out in service, middle aisle, passed out with a massive heart attack in the middle of the sermon. Yeah, you, know, you talk about bringing the house to a real quiet on Easter Sunday morning. They came in, they had 911, they gave him the stuff, they defibrillated him, and you know what? His heart came back. So it was a perfect Easter story. He died and he arose again. Praise Jesus, okay? But it really, it was quiet. But something that has that serious, that one moment that you can be alive, the next moment you can be crunched over dead because of a heart, and heart attacks don't just happen. There are causes of heart attacks, whether it's genetically or whether it is um, with pr proper diet or improper diet. There's all kinds of things that cause to heart attacks. And that's why the Bible talks 799 times about the heart. A heart is very important. If more people in the United States die from heart disease than any other thing, I think it's why we can look at the heart and apply some spiritual applications to the condition of the heart. So we look at Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4, starting about 23 through 27. It says this. I, I like the first phrase. Above all else. Now, when we say above all else, that means more important than anything else. What he's about ready to tell you is one of the most important things that you could ever do above all else. This is more important than what you do. This is more important than the profession that you have. It's more important than any other thing. Above all else, put it in the preeminent spot within your life. Guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. Guard your heart. Because everything that you do flows from that heart. Once you have heart damage, once you have physical heart damage, once you've had a heart attack and you've had open heart surgery, it's very difficult to get back to where you were. It, you may be able to do it, but it takes a while to get back 
to where you are. So he says, above everything else, everything else, guard your heart. Because everything in life flows from that. Your physical condition, your spiritual condition, everything that you enjoy doing could be stopped instantaneously if you do not take care of your heart. Now, we're talking physical heart, and then we're going to apply it to the spiritual heart. 24, keep your mouth free of perversity. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead, fix and gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to your paths for your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the right or turn to the left. Keep your foot from evil. When you say above everything else, we look at all kinds of things. We guard a lot of things. We put deadbolts on our doors. We lock our doors. And nowadays we have to lock every place that we go. We have security cams. At whether it's at your work or whether it's at your house or whether it's at the church, there's security cameras all over the place. You can't go any place without guarding their property. So what we have to do is if every place has to be guarded, and the Bible says we should guard our hearts because it is the priority within your life, how do we guard the things that is a priority? I believe there's three things that we need to do. In the Bible, the heart is deceitful above all things, and it's beyond cure. The heart is deceitful. If we do not guard our hearts and we put our lives on coast mode, what happens is everything that we have and everything that we do is just we stick our head in the sand to say, I think everything will be all right. I don't have to worry about diet. I don't have to worry about where I go or what I say or how I act because everything will be okay. And the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things above all things, and beyond cure. In other words, if we do not guard it on its own merit, it is going to take you places that spiritually you shouldn't go because it is deceitful. It lies. It is the center of our emotions. It's the will. And now, and Jesus even said this in Matthew chapter 15, verse 19. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murders, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. If we do not guard our hearts... It will be very easy for us to fall off the path that God has put in place for us. So if we look at that, how can we do that? Heart conditions. I believe there's three heart conditions. The first one is the distracted heart. I believe a distracted heart. The Bible says that, that I know what I want to do, but then I find myself not doing it. We get distracted. We, we really don't, we're not focused on what we really want to do. We go through life and, and we're just going through life. We don't, we're, we don't have any buy-in. We don't have any care. We just go through life and hoping everything works out. The Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. So I believe even in our life, even in your occupations, and even in your family, even in your finances, what we have to do is we have to be focused. What should I do? I have to do a singular focus. I cannot be distracted. If I am distracted, I cannot do anything proper because I'm trying to do everything halfway. So we cannot be distracted. We have to be, this one thing I do, I run a rise for the prize of the upper call of Jesus Christ. I want to be focused on what is the priority. Sometimes we get distracted. We get distracted in life. We get distracted in our health. We get distracted in all kinds of different ways, and we need to bring that distraction down. What does God want me to do? How can I have that within my heart? And then I believe we have a deceived heart. A deceived heart. Um, sometimes we listen to the wrong person. You know, the two angels on our shoulders, you know, the good angel and the bad angel talking, and, and we just listen to these angels. We hear these voices, and you're saying, well, is this what I should do, or, or should I do this? And we get distracted. We, we really don't understand what's taking place. And then when, once we get distracted, we start listening to the wrong voice, and then we get deceived. And sometimes we go to church, and we really don't know what to do. Sometimes we've gone to church when we were a child, and we accepted Christ, and we know Christ, but yet we've been deceived, and maybe you got hurt. And because of our hurt, our hearts are scarred. And because our hearts are scarred, we really don't want to give our heart to somebody else. We don't want to give our heart to Christ. We've used this illustration many times, but I believe it is so applicable that sometimes our heart has been given to somebody, whether it's a husband or a wife or uh, maybe a boyfriend or a girlfriend or mom or a dad or maybe even a church or a pastor. And you trusted them. You trusted them with all your heart. 
You said, here, I, I want to take my heart out of my chest and I want to give it to you. And through all kinds of different scenarios and situations, they mistreated your heart. They threw that hurt, heart on the ground and they stomped on that heart. And it got dirty and beat up and scarred. And they were done with you. And when they walked out the door, they gave you your heart back and said, there you go. So in your hands, you have this dirty, broken, scarred, battered heart. With tears in your eyes, you put that heart back into your chest. Once that heart's in your chest, you say to yourself, I will never allow anyone to touch my heart again. So you're acting like a football player, you stiff arm and you will never let somebody get close to you. Never. You would never want to feel that way again. Your heart has been beaten, bruised, and scarred. And you said, never again will I ever make that happen. So you, you become distant. You become deceived. You think everybody's going to treat you the way that person treated you, or that church treated you, or your mom or your dad treated you. So you say, I'm going to do this by myself. And all of a sudden, God brings somebody or something into your life that supernaturally transposes that broken heart and your willingness. And you say, I'm going to give it a shot. I'm scared. I really don't know if I can do this or not because I really got hurt. But I love you. So you pull your heart out one more time. And you give it to somebody else. And that person that you gave it to takes care of you. Gives you the very desires of your heart and loves you. And you realize that one person mistreated you, but that person loves you. That's the same parallel that we do with our spiritual heart. Because before we knew Christ, we were really tearing up our spiritual heart. Satan was misusing it and we were battered and bruised. But we met Jesus. And Jesus wanted to take your heart and, and clean your heart and give to you a brand new heart with a new love and a new passion and a new vision. And he wants to take care of you in a way that it is not something that I'm scared of. Now I know that I can give my heart to God. I don't have to be deceived. I don't have to listen to the things of Satan. I can trust in God and God is going to take care of me. And I love what he says in 1 John chapter 1. He says, if we confess our sins... He's faithful and just to forgive us, to cleanse us, to clean our hearts. He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse our life. All we have to do is confess, and he's going to take our heart, take our life, and to clean us. And once that takes place, then I believe we become devoted. I do not believe we can have a devoted heart until we first understand that I can be deceived and I need to who I am listening to. I cannot be distracted. I have to be focused. And then I can be devoted. And here's what I believe the church and our lives are missing. We're missing men and women that are totally devoted followers of Jesus Christ. One that says, I am not going to be distracted of the things of this world. I don't care what everybody else is doing. I'm going to be focused. I'm going to be devoted to the thing that God wants me to do. And once I become devoted, focused, once I know that I'm doing what God wants me to do because God forgave me, I have a clean heart, I trust him with my life, I know that he will never hurt me, he will never leave me, he'll never forsake me, I can totally trust God. Then I become devoted, a devoted, somebody that I know that God says, Bruce, I want you to do this. I, I don't know how to do it. Trust me. You may go places you don't want to go. You may feel like that you're in the waiting room of life. And you may have been there for days or years, and you feel like, is there going to be a doctor here? Is there anybody that's going to see me? Am I going to have to stay in this waiting room this long? And God says, while you're in this waiting room, you can trust, you can read, you can just focus, because what I'm about ready to do is I'm about ready to send the greatest physician into your life, and he is going to take you to where he wants you to go. But there are always times of waiting. There's always those valleys. There's always those dry times that we cannot get in front of God. We have to allow God to do what he wants to do within us. And we have to be devoted. We have to be devoted that we know that God knows what he is doing. 
So how do we do that? I, I want to read a few verses out of uh, Proverbs chapter 4. It says, My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to the flesh. He's saying, listen guys, what I'm about to say this could absolutely change your life. The word of God is here to give us instruction. And in that instruction, the very health of your life, of your spiritual life and your physical life is built up in the heart. The heart of our physical life is an object that pumps. It's a muscle that moves blood and oxygen through our life. And God applies through the word of God the spiritual heart. There is no center. You can't see a spiritual heart. It is the center of the will and the emotions of our soul. Is, he calls it the heart, the center of it. It's the life-giving spiritual power within your life. And we cannot have a spiritual life until we have been forgiven of our past. And once we have been give, forgiven of our past, what he does, he takes out the old, the old heart, and he transplants and he gives you a beautiful new heart that has the ability to forgive, that has the ability to seek God's face, that has the ability to serve others, that you can get away from the anger and the bitterness and all the slander, and you can get away with all the sin and say, I don't want that anymore, and God will give us the power and the ability to live for him. It's the only way that you can do that. You cannot live for God outside of God. You cannot come in and say, I want God's will, but not have God's way. You can't do it. When you say, I need God, God has to transpose his heart to you. He does that through giving you the power of the Holy Spirit within your life. And when you have that, that's when we have the ability to serve him. How do we have a healthy heart? Now, this is really unique. For some reasons, when um, the scripture was given to us, he says, guard your heart. And then you would think that he would tell us how to guard your heart. You would think it would be, whether it's an offensive move or a defensive mood, he'd tell you how to guard your heart. But he tells us this in verse 24. He tells us three things that we have to do to guard our hearts. And it's something that we have to do. To guard means to protect. To put into place an opportunity to keep safe. Whether it is a, a, a guard, whether it's a security guard, or whether it's a... It's a cameras or whether it's a lock, there's always a way that we can guard. We can guard. And he says this, three things. The mouth. He said, put away from your deceitful mouth and put perverse lips far from you. Out of the mouth, the heart speaks. Out of, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what is in your heart is going to come out of your mouth. And you've been around people, and many of you guys work uh, in places where you... Um, you hear a lot of things, right? And you don't, you don't have to quote them here by any means. But it, it, cuss words, dirty language, um, perverse talk, you have to make a decision. Nope, not me. And it may be, you may get belittled for it. You may get laughed at. But you know what? Put away from you deceitful mouth and put perverse lips far from you. In other words, you have to put a decision. Out of the overflow of our heart, the mouth is going to speak. Whether we are going to honor God or we're going to dishonor God, and it's all from the heart. Out of the overflow of our heart, the mouth speaks. And then the eyes in verse 25. Let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. And sometimes we feel like there's an a all-out assault on the Christian character because of our eyes. What we see, what we look at, Sometimes it's like we feel like we have to walk with blinders on. And there's an assault on. It, it is hard. But what we have to do is we have to understand, on purpose, what we look at can cause us to have damage to our spiritual heart. We have to, on purpose, stay focused on what God wants for us. Let your eyes look straight ahead. In other words, don't wander. Don't look around. Stay focused on what God wants for you. Stay focused on what God has in store for you. And then feet. 26 and 27. Ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or turn to the left. Remove your foot from evil. In other words, think before you do. Before you go, 
You ought to think about it. Ponder the path of your feet. In other words, in order to guard your heart, you have to be aware of your surroundings. You have to be aware of what I am about ready to do. And I love this quote. Is what I'm about ready to do worth what I have? Is what I'm about ready to do worth what I have? Because sometimes we have to make a decision. We have to make a decision, and I have to understand, is God in this? Is it going to hurt me? Is it going to hurt my heart? Is it going to cause damage to my relationship with God? Because I need to know there's three things I need to do. My mouth, my eyes, and my feet need to be steadfast with Christ. And if I can do that, I can be helpful. Where your feet trod, your heart will follow. In other words, whatever I do, my heart is going to be taken. Whether it's going to hurt me or it's going to help me. Whether I'm going to be spiritual or whether I'm going to be a failure. It all depends it all determines on what I do with my eyes, my mouth, and my feet. And that's what Proverbs tells us. In order to guard your heart, we have to watch what we say, where we go, and what we see. And I believe that's the foothold into a healthy heart. Now, when I did say that um, life, and life begins at conception. That little heart is built and starts beating. All the way up through death, the physical heart sustains us. And what we do with that physical heart, if we transplant our physical heart with a spiritual heart, what God does when he saves you, he comes and he gives to you a brand new soul, a brand new spirit. He gives to you a spiritual heart that takes over when you die. When you're alive, that physical heart pumps that blood into your soul, into your life, and it gives you the sustenance to live. But once we close our eyes and we take our last breath, then that spiritual heart takes over. And once we give up our life here, the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And once we've given up our life and our heart stops beating down here, our spiritual heart takes over. And it depends on what you have done with your physical heart, whether you have a spiritual heart. And if we have never asked God to give to us a spiritual heart, if we've never asked God to forgive us of my sins and accept him as our Lord and Savior, we are living with a physical heart and we have no idea what the spiritual heart is for. And the spiritual heart is something that's so wonderful. It's something within our life that we have the opportunity to forgive. We have the opportunity to be forgiven. You know, our physical heart, when they're damaged and, and it's hurt and it's, it's broken, it, they're scars. Those scars are going to be with you forever. They're mental, emotional scars buried on your soul and on your heart. And you may not talk about it. It may be hidden deep well within your life, but they're there. And you may be the only person that you have ever known about, or maybe you haven't talked about it for years. But something takes place, and something is said, or something is done. And instantaneously, instantaneously, the emotion of that past has come up, and it boils up within you because that scar is real. Whether it's hateful or hurtful. Sad, but it's still there. And you're saying, I've tried everything, I have no idea how to get rid of it. And you may never, ever get rid of the pain of the past. But the only way that you're going to deal with the pain of the past, if you let Christ give you the power to forgive, not only others, the power to forgive yourself. Because most scars are deep. They're hurtful. We don't even know how to deal with them most of the time. But the only scar that I can deal with is I said, Lord, I need your help. And what he does it's the greatest thing in the world. He reaches down and he says, you're forgiven. I have to understand my forgiveness. I have to understand I am broken. I have to understand I can't fix myself. But Jesus can. And once I have been forgiven, once I've accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior, then and only then can I face to face with the ability to forgive the ability to face my hurt, the scars of my life, and allow Christ to transport from his heart to my heart, to 
clean my heart, to love me no matter what. I love that. Maybe you feel like that you've done too much, and maybe you feel like that, that God will never forgive me, and maybe you feel like that God is upset at you, maybe that you're in the waiting room of life and you think that God has abandoned you, but God hasn't. God is taking your life, he's preparing your future, he's forgiving you of your sins, he's putting you in the perfect place in order to do his perfect plan, but what we have to do is we have to be devoted unto him and wait and honor and love and be prepared with a pure heart to say, Lord, what do you want me to do? I will willing to do whatever you ask of me. Be ready. As you are waiting, as you're in your desert place, as you're hungry and thirsty to do God's work, do, God, do it God's way. And how do you do it God's way? Is just listen, learn, and love, and allow God to give you that pure heart, the real heart, the spiritual heart that we're going to talk about next week because there's no way that we as believers can do what God wants us to do until we first have the passion and the desire to humbly go before God with an open heart. The Bible says, David says, it's created me a clean heart, O Lord. He even says this in Psalm chapter 51, uh, uh, examine my heart, examine me. In other words, open me up, open me up in full view to make sure my heart is one that's pleasing unto you. And if we get to the point that we can say, Lord, examine, I don't care what you find, whatever you find, whatever you bring up to my remembrance, whatever I have done wrong, I want you to examine my heart and I am willing to forgive, I am willing to give, I am willing to start over if you are willing to show me what to do and how to do it. When we as a church and as individuals can look to God and say, examine me, search me, O oh Lord, I open my life to you. And God supernaturally does great things in our life. But if we are closed, if we're afraid, if we don't want to give in, we hold on to ourselves, God is knocking at your heart's door. And he said, I need you to let me in. I need you to trust me. I can't do what I need to do with you until you open up the door of your heart and let me change you. Let me forgive you. Let me transform you into the godly person that I want you to be. It's all about the heart. The most inner part of your soul is our spiritual heart. We can't get distracted. We can't be deceived. We must end up being devoted followers of Christ. Let's go, Lord, in prayer.